Welcome, welcome to our debate this evening. So good to see everyone. Looks like you've made some new friends. Uh, I'm just using the wireless, Quincy, so I'm not even using that one. Uh, but uh, good to see you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming out tonight on this debate on free will. This, of course, is Reformation Week. So uh, what better time to talk about one of the topics of the Reformation, which is uh, the nature of the human will in relation to salvation, and I guess other matters as well. Uh, I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor of this wonderful congregation, First Evangelical Lutheran Church. I'll be the moderator and, more importantly, the timekeeper tonight. Um, and as one who fast forwards through boring introductions on YouTube, I'm going to talk really fast now and keep this brief. Uh, I want to thank our four speakers, uh, all of whom, none of whom are in Houston. Some drove uh, and flew and came from very far away uh, to be here tonight. So I want to thank them for all the time and study that they put into this event. Um, if you need a bathroom, just make yourself at home. They're behind me. You go through one of these side doors, and there's a hallway back there, and there are bathrooms there. So just, just get up and go as needed. Um, we will have a reception afterwards and some books for sale, and uh, maybe these uh, gentlemen will be so kind as to sell you a book and sign it for you. So please do stay. There will be some snacks. And the uh, taco truck is also open for business tonight. So if you get the munchies... Uh, go to the taco truck afterwards, and the tacos are delicious. Um, please note, uh, this is a disclaimer I always put out, that uh, we're the host of this event and uh, a sponsor of the uh, event, but none of our speakers necessarily share all of our views on, uh, on everything our denomination holds. Uh, our denomination, the North American Lutheran Church, uh, does ordain women, uh, and just because we do or our denomination does does not mean that our speakers hold to that. So uh, just wanted to let you know they don't endorse uh, that per se. If you like these conversations or these kinds of conversations, I host a radio show on KPFT 90.1, uh, and there's something in your program about that. Uh, it's a podcast as well, and we have these kinds of conversations on a regular basis. The format for tonight is in your program. Uh, our traditional Baptist friends will be going first this evening. We'll have opening remarks of 20 minutes total per team, 10 minutes per person, rebuttals 10 minutes per team, and then cross-examination 10 minutes per team, and closing remarks 5 minutes per team. Our Q&A will be done via you writing questions uh, and handing them in. There will be a time where uh, one of our volunteers will be gathering up all the questions. So I personally made sure that all the pencils were sharp in the pews today. So uh, if you uh, need to write a question, you should have gotten a card. If you didn't get a card, uh, let us know. There should be a, a pile in the back. Everyone always asks what these numbers are for. They're the hymns that we sung on Sunday. So, um, you know, these hymn boards just don't look right without hymn numbers in them, so I keep them in there. Uh, and so if you want to know what we sang for Reformation Sunday, those are the numbers. Uh, please hold your applause until the end of, of each section. Bios, biographies for each speaker are in your program, and I'm not going to read them to you now. Um, but I think we are ready to go. So uh, I would invite our uh, first speaker to uh, make his way to the pulpit, and please welcome them. Greetings, and I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I want to thank First Evangelical Lutheran Church for being such gracious hosts and our uh, moderator tonight, Brother Evan. I want to thank our opponents. You all could have done otherwise, but you freely chose to come here, so we thank you for that. The debate question tonight is, what is the biblical view of free will? This is an important question because it goes to the heart of the nature and character of God. Now, my debate part, uh, partner tonight, Leighton Flowers and I, we believe in the absolute maximal sovereignty of God. He is sovereign over all things, including all of our choices. He is sovereign over who is saved and who is not saved. And we hope that our opponents would agree with us on that. We also believe in the absolute sinfulness of man. Man is both dead in sin and a slave to sin. All Christians should affirm that sin has separated us from God. 
and that sinners are utterly incapable of saving themselves on their own in any sense of the word save. We hope that our opponents share our view of that as well. So with these things in mind, the claim tonight that we are defending is that the biblical view of free will is the soft libertarian view of free will. This view of free will is presupposed everywhere in scripture. All proof texts that could be marshaled regarding the sinfulness of man do not negate this view of free will, but rather they demonstrate the complete misuse of the free will. A simple definition. Soft libertarian freedom is that you have the ability to choose between options, you could have chosen otherwise, and that all choices are self-determined, not causally determined by factors beyond the self. While choices can be influenced by external factors, such factors do not determine the choices. Now, this is not a superpower. This does not make man boastful, nor is it uh, enough for man to be almighty to thwart God's sovereign will or his plans. Free will is itself a gift from God. We believe there are no passages in scripture that require determinist readings, but there are many passages that require libertarian readings or otherwise scripture is deceitful and hopelessly convoluted and God is not the author of confusion. The Bible tells us that God wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, meaning believers, but not our sins only, but sins of the whole world. And in context, that means the world of unbelievers. We have set our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe. These and other passages has informed most of Christendom outside of Lutheran and Calvinist traditions that if these teachings are indeed true, determinism is necessarily false. Why is that? Because if determinism was true and these teachings are true as well, then universalism would have to follow from these biblical teachings. But we believe that universalism is false and we hope that they believe that universalism is false. And therefore, it seems that necessarily libertarian free will must be true to account for why not everyone is saved. Deuteronomy, 13, uh, Deuteronomy 30, 15 and verse 19 is a charter statement in scripture and the entire story. It reads, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Note that this passage says to choose. If determinism is true, then people only discover themselves making a choice that was predetermined for them to choose. In this case, there's no way for this passage to be disingenuous and deceitful. People aren't having a choice set before them, but only predetermined inevitabilities set before them. Determinism makes void any meaningful sense of the word choose and renders the idea illusory. Rather, choose means what we ordinarily think it means to choose in terms of making choices. These and other passages all make good sense without determinism and make no sense with determinism. While the terms and the intents of the old covenant and the new covenant differ, their nature to participate by choosing between life and death does not change. All covenants of God are indeed covenants of grace, which also demonstrates why libertarian free will makes the most sense. Grace is not a religious as opposed to secular term, Rather, in its biblical context, it is a socioeconomic word that pertains to the ethos of patron-client reciprocity. Grace that is in any way manipulated, in that sense irresistible, it is not grace as the New Testament authors and the original audiences of Scripture would recognize. What is freely given in grace must be freely received with gratitude, and gratitude must be returned. The question of whether grace is resistible or irresistible is actually irrelevant. God irresistibly in common grace brings the sun up every morning, as well as he has irresistibly and unchangeably sent Jesus to die for the sins of the whole world. That is the grace of God that has appeared that brings salvation to all men, according to Titus 2.11. The real issue is whether or not one shows proper gratitude in response to God's gracious provisions. Through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit and the gracious power of the gospel, people can show proper gratitude to God by their faith and repentance or ingratitude to God through their continued rejection of his overtures. Either way, God is afforded the highest glory and honor simply by having extended the beneficence, the grace 
in the first place to ungrateful, ungrateful, wicked sinners. Regeneration or being born again cannot be prior to this gratitude response of repentance and faith, either logically or otherwise, because being reborn into the divine family is one of the benefits of being in Christ. The prologue of John 1 is filled with the language of patronage and kinship. Jesus, the one who is full of grace and truth, is the broker agent on behalf of the Father to confer divine benefits. It is to those who receive him, to them he gives the right to become children of God. Elabon in the Greek, it means to take hold of him. This is the kinship language. In the biblical context, they receive a new familial pedigree and the associated ascribed honor of being a part of the divine lineage. This new pedigree is not of blood meaning of the class of human lineage, nor of the will of flesh, which is essentially a euphemism for sex, nor the will of man, meaning having its origin in the human willing, but rather it is of God. In John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus that in order to see the kingdom, he must be born again, born again of spirit, not of the flesh. Jesus later explains to receive this kinship and see the kingdom, he must believe in Jesus, the king of the kingdom. As Moses lifted the serpent in the desert, so Jesus too is lifted up and all who look to the Son and believe will have eternal life. If being born again precedes faith, then Jesus' teaching makes no sense. People are not healed of the venom so they can look to the serpent, nor are they born again so they can look to the cross and believe. Rather, they looked to the serpent to be healed of the venom. And so they look to the cross to have eternal life. Calvinist friends of ours, they get Jesus' teaching backwards. While the corporate Jubilant Gentile people of Christ were chosen before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1.4, individuals are born again and placed in Christ by the Spirit upon repentance and faith, according to Ephesians 1.11. Because salvation by grace through faith is itself a gift, a gracious overture of God that it works that way in Ephesians 2.8, libertarian free will makes the best sense because faith is a response of the recipients of God's grace. It is not something that the divine patron performs on behalf of the recipient. In any case, our primary concern with affirming libertarian free will is not that we like it, but rather we believe it is a necessary affirmation so that God is not understood as the author of evil. While the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 asserts that God is not the author of evil, the theological and philosophical ideas that underwrite chapter 3 and its assertions simply necessitate the charge, despite blustering protest to the contrary. You cannot affirm defined determinism and then say God is not the author of evil without a coherent explanation. The lack of any coherent explanation for this on this issue is the reason why Christianity has overwhelmingly rejected the divine determinism, or in a, some people call it compatibilism, that consistent Calvinists and many consistent Lutherans have affirmed. If sinful agents cannot possibly do other than what God has both decreed and determined and ensured that they do, and ensured that they want to do it, then God is the author of evil and there is no sense in holding them responsible even if God wants to punish them. This will simply not do. This has God being both the arsonist and the fireman who is the hero who puts out the fire. There's no analogy or argument to make divine determinism conclude with not God being the author of evil or we have yet to hear one. All interpretations that cause someone to infer determinism from any passage has necessarily misunderstood the text and they have interpreted the text wrongly. Thank you. I too want to echo the thank yous of my colleague and say thank you to this church, Pastor Evan, for hosting this, the work that you've done, and to our esteemed opponents. Um, we are brothers in Christ, and I want you to understand a lot of people think of debate as being something that's just divisive. Um, why are you debating? You're a Christian. You shouldn't debate with each other. This is a part of education. Matter of fact, I would say men really engage with this kind of education, maybe more so than just lecturers. And so I appreciate my opponents for taking this on as an opportunity for us to learn from each other as brothers. And I want you to know I love these brothers in Christ, 
and that we treat each other with respect, though there's polemics in our discussions. We're going to strongly disagree with each other on some points. We do love one another and want you to understand that. With that said, let's dive in. Oh, by the way, have you noticed, does anybody else notice, it's the, uh, the non-Calvinists that have the beards? You know, the, you know. I just thought that was strange. All right, allow me to sum up our disagreement. Make it real simple, okay? Our opponents believe that our eternal destinies are decided by God before we are even born, without any regard to our future choices or our actions. And therefore, whether we go to heaven or hell is absolutely, has absolutely nothing to do with us. It is an inevitable consequence beyond our control. On Calvinism, you have absolutely nothing to do with where you spend eternity. As John Calvin himself said, quote, God ordains by his judgments that some from their mother's womb are destined irrevocably to eternal death in order to glorify God's name in their perdition. Is this what the Bible teaches? I do not believe so. All throughout the scripture, we see the concept of choice. As my, opponent, as my colleague pointed out, this is sometimes called libertarian free will. But the word choice is really all we need here. You look in Webster's, the ability to select between available options. You don't need a philosophy degree to get this. It's really simple. You have a choice to make. We see choice throughout all of scripture. From the very beginning in the garden, we see God finished creating mankind in his own image and God declared it was very good. God made man good. And I think all of us on this stage would say he did not create a sinful or fallen man. Yet somehow, mysteriously, that good man and that good woman chose to sin. That's free will. He could have resisted the temptation, but he chose to rebel. That's libertarian free will. The apostle John said, quote, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but of the world, 1 John 2, 6. That means there are some things, namely men's evil desires, that are not of God. They are separate from God, which by the way, when we defend free will, what we're defending here is his holiness. Those evil desires have their source outside of God. Those desires are from the creature not the creator. As A.W. Tozer convincingly argues, God decided not which choices we would make, but that we would be free to make them, and that a God less than sovereign would be afraid to grant that kind of freedom. Choice is not only seen in the garden, it's also seen throughout all the prophets. Isaiah 118, for one example, says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. In other words, this is soteriological. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will be blessed. You will eat of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. There is choice. Deuteronomy 30, as Jonathan just mentioned, I set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Choose life, God says. Ezekiel says, cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed. By making yourself a new heart and a new spirit, why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Joshua called out to the people saying, choose you this day whom you will serve. And Jesus, of course, he came along saying, whosoever believes will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And he goes on to say, come to me all who are weak and heavy laden and I will give you rest. The apostle Paul continued this message by saying in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Choice is implicit in each of these and so many more passages throughout the entire Bible. But what about those few times throughout the text where it seems that men make choices that are really seemingly determined by God behind the scenes? For example, Joseph's brothers are sold into slavery and years later he declares what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Or what about the Assyrians in Isaiah chapter 10? They were used as a means of discipline against Israel. And yet God still holds them culpable for what they did. What about Pharaoh? He was hardened by God. And yet he still hold account, he's held accountable for what he did. Or the biggest example of them all, the crucifixion. Acts 2.23, it says, Jesus is delivered up according to the definite plan 
and the foreknowledge of God. Don't these passages mean that people really aren't making free choices at all? Do, do these passages mean that God is really secretly, he's secretly behind the scenes deciding everything that every single human being will always decide for all eternity and punishing them anyway? Is that what he means by this? I don't think so. I'll explain why. Does proof that God works to bring about one event also prove that he works to bring about every other event? Of course not, it's a non sequitur. Appealing to God's sovereign work to ensure the redemption of something so as to prove that God sovereignly works to bring about all the sin that was redeemed is an absurd and self-defeating argument. It would be tantamount to arguing that because a police department set up a sting operation to catch a notorious drug dealer, that the police department is somehow responsible for every single intention and action of all drug dealers at all times. Of course, we celebrate their, and we reward the actions of the police department because they are working to stop drug activity, not because they are secretly bringing about all drug activity just so as to stop some of it. In the same way, teaching that God brings about all sin based upon how he brought about Calvary or the Passover or other redemptive events throughout history is like teaching that the police officer brings about every drug dealer and every drug deal based upon how he brought about his sting operations. Please hear me. If what John Calvin says is true on this particular issue, then God worked to sovereignly bring about the redemption, for example, of, of a child abuser in the same way that he worked to sovereignly bring about the abuse of that child. And this flies in the face of so much of what we read in scripture about the character and the holiness of our God. You see, on Calvinism, God seems to be sovereignly working so as to redeem his own sovereign workings. Listen, we can affirm God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. That's sovereignty, Psalm 115.3. We just don't believe that God is pleased to meticulously determine heinous evil in this world. As verse 16 of the same chapter goes on to confirm, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. This means it pleases God not to meticulously control everything on earth, but to give the earth over to man, to give his creatures a certain level of autonomy or separateness. This is again a defense of his holiness. Free will, choice is defending the holiness and the goodness and the character of our God. This is why the Lord instructed his followers to pray for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. A prayer that makes little sense if indeed God is already meticulously controlling all that happens on earth by some quote unquote sovereign decree never mentioned in the pages of scripture. A distinction has to be drawn between the limitless power of God and how God chooses to use that power. Sure, he can do whatever he wants, but you can't assume God wants a world of puppets or of robots. Now let me pause and just say, when I was a Calvinist for a decade, I hated when somebody accused Calvinism of being a puppet world or uh, a robot world. And you know how I rebutted that when somebody would bring that to me as a Calvinist? I would say, how dare you, oh man, to talk back to God? According to Romans 9, Paul says we are mere vessels. We're dirt, we're mud in the hands of a potter. Now, however, I allow scripture to help me interpret scripture. And I consider the other passages where Paul used this exact same analogy, like in 2 Timothy 2, 20, where he says now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some for honor and some for dishonor. Sound familiar? Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. That is choice. Or we could go to Jeremiah 18, the passage from which Paul is likely borrowing this analogy, where he calls Israel a vessel, dirt, and they are given the choice to repent. And he said that he would relent and not destroy them. On Calvinism, there is no real choice to be made because ultimately God has already chosen everyone's choice for them. Again, as John Calvin himself put it, some are predestined to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. Calvin says they're doomed from the womb, they're banished from birth. As Dr. Pritchett has rightly reminded us, there is not one verse in all of scripture that demands the theistic determinism of John Calvin. There are, however, many passages that demand choice. 
The burden on our brothers tonight is to demonstrate biblically that mankind has lost the power of choice due to the fall. And let me just remind you, that choice is not made in a vacuum. We're not alone in making our choices. We're making choices in response to God's gracious, powerful, Holy Spirit sent revelation. He sends the son, he sends the law, the tutor, the schoolmaster to help us to understand our need. He sends the gospel called the power of God unto salvation. You see, while our opponents are seeking to defend God's power to control his enemies, we seek to defend God's character as one who loves and gives his life for all his enemies. Thank you for your time tonight. Scripture says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Praise God for this opportunity to be here with you this evening. I'd like to thank Pastor Evan for hosting this debate and also to Dr. Pritchett and Dr. Flowers for accepting this challenge. Now, since this debate covers gospel essentials, I need to give a quick disclaimer. This is not going to be an in-house debate, nor are my arguments going to be personal attacks against either of my opponents because I believe both of them are made in the image of God and are to be treated with dignity and respect. However, since this debate does cover gospel essentials, I need to make it known very clearly that my arguments are not going to be personal, they will be polemical, because I will not soft pedal the irrevocable truth of scripture, especially since I believe my opponent's position tonight stands on tradition and not truth. And I'll explain to you why. Because I believe God, in his sovereign decree, he predestines. He has a divine decree. And you know what it is? It's discriminative. It's extensive, eternal. And it is free and absolute. So either you're going to affirm free grace or you are going to affirm a false gospel. Let me share with you something very important here about the topic of tonight's debate. What is a biblical view of free will? My colleague and I are going to argue tonight that there is no such thing as autonomous free will. And that is because we affirm our Lord's free grace, while our opponents affirm libertarian free will, because that is essentially what this debate is all about, free grace versus free will. So let me explain to you something about my position on the Arminian position on free will. This is somewhat of a disclaimer I want to share very quickly so that way you know the position that I'm coming from. There is a classical work out there that is written by Christopher Ness, and it's titled The Antidote to Arminianism. And let me explain to you a little bit about the content you're going to find in that book. It calls Arminianism a foul heresy, the root and core of all heretical false doctrine. It calls it the, the great idol of fallen men. It's the Pope's Benjamin, the elixir of anti-Christianism, and is the spawn of popery. Also, it says ancient Pelagianism, or I'm sorry, modern Arminianism is but ancient Pelagianism, and Pelagianism is popery, and popery is another name for man's free will in opposition to God's free grace. Also, I stand with men like Augustus Toplady. He argued very distinctly that Arminianism came from the Church of Rome and leads back to the pit from whence it was dug. Now, here's why I stand with that position about God's eternal decree, because God is absolutely sovereign. He is an electing, eternal, and immutable judge, and nothing comes to pass outside of his eternal decree. God, from all eternity, he has decreed in himself all things whatsoever comes to pass, and this is according to his eternal and immutable counsel of his free will. Now, let me explain to you something here about this. When you say, well, my will must precede God's grace, let me explain to you something. The grace of God, he will not bow, be subject to suppress. He will not yield to anyone or anything, since he does not derive his glory from anyone. God does as he pleases. He controls everything, rules over everything. In his divine and infinite grace, he has predestined his chosen before the foundation of the world so that way they would receive the eternal inheritance with him in glory to the praise of his glorious grace. But he also has vessels of wrath prepared for destruction according to his infinite justice. God does as he pleases with the salvation or the damnation of sinners. Now, I want you all to pay very close attention tonight, and we're going to get to this during our cross-examination time and also our rebuttals, to their position. Because it can be a little deceptive. I'm sure if we ask them all tonight, do you believe the Bible to be the infallible rule of faith that constitutes their salvation? 
Do you believe that God is sovereign? Do you believe that salvation is by grace, through faith, excluding works? They're going to say yes to these things. They're not going to come out and say, yeah, we affirm cheap grace, or we affirm we elevate our eisegetical traditions above exegetical truths. They're not going to come out and admit these things. But I'm here to tell you this today, that they're not here to defend the divine grace of God or free grace. They're here to defend free will and man's decision. Let me share with you Leighton's explanation on free will, his definition of it. It's in his book. He says that libertarian freedom, sometimes called contracausal or autonomous freedom, is the categorical ability of the will to refrain or not refrain from any given moral action. He says, human autonomy does not mean that a man can be saved apart from divine work, but merely that the creature acts independently or autonomously apart from God when choosing moral evil, including their rejection of divine providence. Now you have to flesh out that argument. Because when you flesh out the human autonomy argument, you're going to realize that you can't be saved without it in that position. And this right here is why I have to explain what is a definition of free will. Because to, be, to be use logic here, universally the term free will means that if the will is free, then it is not predetermined or uncaused. That means God does not determine a man's decision to be saved. Now let me explain to you something that's very important about this, okay? Flowers' position has more in common with Catholicism than it does with Christ. Roman Catholic Catechism 155, here's what it says. Human intellect and the will cooperate with divine grace. It says, believing is the act of the intellect, assenting to divine truth by command of the will, moved by God through grace. This right here is not language from heaven. This is lies from hell. Let me explain to you something about this position here about Roman Catholicism, okay? His position, that's why when he calls himself traditional SBC, we should all ask him, does SBC stand for slowly becoming Catholic? Because his position sides with Rome and not with Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know the problem with accepting this position? It elevates a dead sinner above a divine savior. It makes you a teacher of your own righteousness, a despiser of free grace. Let me share with you several reasons today why you need to reject this position. Number one, I want you to consider man's sinful condition. Scripture tells us that we are born in sin, dead in sin, conceived in sin, servant of sin, subjects of death, that we are by nature children of wrath. We're totally defiled in all faculties and parts of the body and the soul, that we are utterly indisposed, disabled, made opposite of all good, wholly inclined to do all evil. Now, if you believe you can come to God by exercising your free will, then that's to falsely assume that you have the desire to do that, which clearly the Scripture says you do not. Romans 3 says, no one understands God. No one seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They all become unprofitable. There is no one who does good. No, not one. William Jenkins once said that the bending of man's heart to believe and to persevere is the supernatural fruits of God's eternal decree and not the natural fruits of man's frail and depraved free will. I want you to consider this argument right now. If you believe you have the ability to exercise your free will to be saved and then God justifies you, what about another person who decides to do the same thing but God doesn't justify him? Then that would mean God would be a respecter of persons and we know the Bible says God is not. Think about the problems with that specific argument right there. That means you are saved because you made a decision better than someone else. How could you possibly pray being an Arminian who believes in free will? God, thank you that you gave me free will to choose you. Although there are going to be many people in hell, thank you that my decision was better than someone else. That way I can rescue myself from your wrath and come to you on my own time, on my own terms, and not what you have declared before the foundation of the world. That right there is a self-exalting position to hold. If the power of God in the gospel is only possible if you cooperate or if your will precedes God's, then who do you have to attribute salvation to? This boastful belief. Don't you find it ironic that most Arminians believe that they chose their bride according to their free will, but Christ can't choose his according to his free grace? That was an argument that Charles Spurgeon had gave, and it was pretty good. Let me explain to you something else. The Bible tells us clearly, it says we are justified freely by his grace. But these men can't hold to that position here today. You know why? Because it's contingent upon their decision. Grace cannot be free if it is contingent upon a man's decision. And I'll tell you why. Because it puts God's decree under man's decision as opposed to putting man's decision under God's decree. 
You can never have assurance of your salvation under that worldview. Because if you have the free will to have salvation, then when you have that salvation, to be logically consistent, you could also have the free will to reject it. It is a man-centered gospel. Consider this argument. I accepted Christ. I chose Christ. I decided to follow Jesus. I said my prayer. I walked my aisle. But you will find none of that in the Bible anywhere. So under that position, who gets the glory in that? Or you could go to Scripture. God foreknows. God predestines. God calls. God justifies. God glorifies. Who gets the glory in that argument? Don't you find it ironic that Jesus said clearly, a man must be born again or he cannot see the kingdom of God. Oh, but there are many. He can choose his parents and he can decide uh, the time he wants to be born again, right? Don't you find it also ironic that a patient who's dying and needs a heart transplant, they're going to need a donor to supply the new heart to them. They're going to have to have a competent doctor to implant it inside of themselves. Oh, but these two gentlemen right here, can uh, spiritually supply themselves the new heart and implant it inside of themselves by exercising their frail and depraved free will? This position here makes man true and God a liar. Because if your will precedes God, then when Paul said, when God works in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure, then Paul was a liar. But here's what I say. Let man be true and let God be let God be true and let every man be a liar. And I'll tell you why. Because if you think you can save yourself, I think Christ made it very clear. With men, things are impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. like also to extend my thanks to everybody. Um, it's kind of neat up here. Let me, uh, yeah, okay. Let me uh, start with a word of prayer, please. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. You are the Lord God Almighty that reigns forever. We know, Lord, that you are gracious, and that you are loving, and that you are just and that you are merciful, and that you are sovereign. And we do not see that man can thwart that in any way, because you said that you have decreed the end from the beginning, and that your will indeed will be done. May it be done even here this evening, for the glory of the triune God, through Christ we pray. Amen. And amen. The debate tonight, if you want to call it a debate, it's a, it's a difference of opinion. But it's what does the Bible say about free will? Well, I'm really glad that, that one of the opponents tonight said that it's presupposed because it cannot be demonstrated. You see, it's presupposed in the Bible. No, it's not, pre it's not presupposed in the Bible. The only thing that's presupposed in the Bible is God. You don't find an argument anywhere for God, okay? But without God, you can't make sense of anything, okay? Let me tell you who this God is. He's the God of Jeremiah. He's the God of Isaiah. When you read through these books, if you're honest, do you come away after reading the book of Isaiah thinking, yeah, man can thwart God's plans, you know? He has the ability to keep God from doing something that he wants. Wow! Sorry about that. I didn't realize it was going to get that loud. Or do you come away thinking, God is almighty. The nations are considered as nothing. Even less than nothing. Let me ask you this. Man, who are you? Are you a member of a nation? Yes. Does it matter which nation? No, because all the nations are nothing before this God. 
And you as an individual, do you think that the mighty nations through history that are nothing, indeed less than nothing before God, that you puny man, you can thwart the will of God? Absolutely not. Who would dare to take such a position? Here they are, these two gentlemen have. They believe that God's will to save can be thwarted by someone that is less than nothing. Why listen to this? This, according to Calvinistic history, is heresy, my friends. Elevating the will of man over God is heresy. Jeremiah would tell you that. Isaiah would tell you that. Daniel would tell you that. Any number of books. And you know who else will tell you that? Jesus will tell you that. Because do you know what he said? He said, without me, you can do nothing. Huh. We can build skyscrapers. Look at Genesis. Look at this great tower that we elevated. Yeah, that's what, that's what you can do. But the tower didn't reach the God, did it? Man can do a lot of things in this universe. We have air conditioning. Thank goodness for that, right? Men did that, right? Yes, through the wisdom that God gave them. But does that make us any closer to God because we have air conditioning and some person out in the jungle doesn't? Are we closer to God because we have seat belts? Are we closer to God because we have electricity? Are we closer to God because we can do things in this world? No. Yeah, you make choices every day. Those that believe that the imperatives of Scripture magically become the indicatives of free will are surely mistaken. Let me tell you from Genesis chapter 20, where a man didn't exercise his free will like he wanted to. Let me read to you. This is from Genesis chapter 20. Abraham journeyed from there to the south, dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerah. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Abimelech, he said, well, wait, I had not come to her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she even herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. Now listen to this very, very carefully, okay? God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Here's man with his free will. Here's man wanting to sleep with this woman. He is the king of the country. He is the most powerful man in the nation. He can do whatever he wants. And yet God tells him, I did not let you touch her. Now, this is one example. There are many like it. What does the New Testament tell us? Well, of course, there are again passages and passages and passages. The main reason that I became a Calvinist, if that's the term, is because I recognize that in Ephesians chapter 1, and this is one of those few places, gentlemen, where all means all, God works all things after the counsel of his will. Even keeping those kings who want to commit adultery from committing so. And when he wants to, he orders those to commit adultery when he wants to. You don't know this God of scripture because you choose the texts that you seek to follow. But my God is in heaven and he does as he pleases. When he sent Shimei to throw rocks at David, what did David say? Oh, he is exercising his free will, just leave him. 
No, he said, the Lord told him to throw those rocks when it was a sin to put your hand against the king. When Jesus Christ, our Lord, came to this earth, what is the greatest crime in history? It is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men took Jesus, and according to the determinative counsel of his will, they crucified him. God's own son was predestined to die. Let me ask you a question. Because of that, you have to agree. You can't disagree that Jesus was predestined to die. If you do, you're just denying scripture. First Peter 2 tells us, First Peter 1 rather, tells us that that's true. Now let's go back to the garden for a minute. When God created Adam, he didn't give him free will. He gave him a command. He said, do not touch this tree or do not eat from this tree. Now, my opponents believe that Adam had free will. Let me ask you a question. Did God know that Adam would fall? If he did, then what knowledge was there? There was knowledge of him falling? Then was Adam truly free to reject what God knew would happen? My opponent is going to raise his hands and say, mystery, mystery, mystery. We can't explain that. We don't know how. We just know that God knows everything, but we're still free. Well, in his definition that he cites three times in his book, you cannot have free will and have God know everything at the same time. Because by definition, a future free action is unknowable. It's unknowable doesn't exist until I make my decision. Until I exercise my free will, there is nothing to know. That's why my friend should affirm or should embrace, as they're clearly almost there, open theism. They should embrace a consistent position that acknowledges just exactly what they truly, truly believe, that God is not in control, he does not know, he has not ordained, he is not the governor of the universe. His will is thwarted. And man is the master of his own fate. No, my friends, this is not true. We who are less than nothing cannot thwart the Almighty. We must, we must acknowledge that God is great, that the scriptures present a great God. He's the sovereign Lord. He rules from on high. Jesus said, even the very hairs of your head are numbered, and not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. Hairs and sparrows, the very things that are so insignificant, they are the least important things that one can envision. And yet, those things, he says, do not occur apart from the Father's will. Indeed, all things occur according to the Father's will. Amen. Before we begin the uh, rebuttal section, I just want to ask, because this is a live room, can y'all understand what is being said, or is some of the speech too fast? If it's too fast, just raise your hand a little. Okay, so a few people think it's a little too fast, so I know we're excited. Just so you know, there we go. But most people can understand All right. Um, as you know, that the debate question tonight is, what is the biblical view of free will? Our opponents have answered that there is no biblical view of free will. Uh, they have accused us tonight of tradition, not truth. However, it's, I find it ironic that in the week of the celebrating the Reformation, they gave us nothing but tradition and no argument. All they did was get on this stage, yell real loud, and set a straw man on fire. They talked about the sovereignty of God, but I don't believe they actually know what the word means. The word means that God is sovereign. He is an absolute authority. Now, if our opponents want to be like the LGBT 
community and redefine words like marriage to mean between two people and they want to redefine sovereignty to mean something like determinism, I would like them to be upfront about it and just stop using the word sovereignty because it doesn't mean what they seem to imply that it means. It just means that God is ruler. They say this is a debate between free grace and free will. Um, no, it's not. That is a false dichotomy. Uh, free grace is the grace of God that has appeared to all men. That is free. Okay? Grace is not opposed to free will. We never said, even though Sonny said that we claimed, that our free will precedes God's will and God's grace. No one made that argument tonight. Yet another straw man. What we said is that when God extends his grace to everyone, you have the obligation to respond with gratitude. If you continue in your ingratitude towards God for his grace, then you will suffer the eternal consequences. God is not a respecter of persons because he wants everyone to be saved and not everyone is saved. If God arbitrarily elected people in eternity past, that is respecting some persons, not others, so that cuts both ways. So we didn't hear anything um, other than tradition and argument. A few Bible verses that went without explanation. We agree that God is in heaven and does everything that he pleases. The question is, what does it please God to do? Does it please God to command people to commit adultery? I don't, I don't think so. It's not th See, God is not the author of evil and the determiner of evil. What God does is God is the usurper and the redeemer of evil. Now, God uses the evil actions of men to carry out his purposes. But that is entirely different than commanding people to do evil so that he can bring about good purposes. G uh, in James, it says, God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt others with evil. But yet, if God is causing people to do evil and not redeeming the evil that they do, then God has been tempted by evil for, uh, for means of self-glorification, and that is not glorious. What is glorious is that despite man's sinful actions that man does by abusing their free will, God gloriously redeems that evil, and he usurps that evil. He is not the cause of evil. So we want to make that clear. It is a debate tonight between two opinions. They talk about the grace of God, but they don't seem to understand what grace actually is in its first century context. If you are not talking about what grace means in its first century context, then you're not talking about anything that the Bible is talking about. So why should we care what they're talking about if they're talking about it on 16th century terms, not first century terms? Same thing with free will. When we talk about free will, if they say that this is the heresy that we actually respond to God, either accepting his grace or rejecting his grace, if that's the heresy, Every Christian, from the disciples of the disciples to the second half of Augustine's career, were heretics. That's ridiculous. And then God had no people but heretics all the way until maybe Martin Luther, but it seems to be John Calvin, but I don't think that they're taking Calvin's view quite on the will here either. Now, God did choose his bride. God chose believers in Jesus. That is God's sovereign prerogative to choose his bride. Nobody is denying that. Now, for the rest of their things, they did agree with us that man is sinful and can do nothing without God. But God is not like Pharaoh in Exodus 5 who commands the impossible and withholds what they need to accomplish the commands. God is the God of Isaiah 5 who has done everything that he can and still wonders why the grapes go sour. That's not our tradition. That's the book of Isaiah. So, I mean, we agree with the Bible. I, I assume they agree with the Bible, so it's going to be a difference of opinions. But we believe that when you take the Bible and as a whole, what is the Scripture about? It is setting before you life and death. Choose life so that you may live.
Lost man's inability to seek God does not equal the inability to respond to a God who is actively seeking to save the lost. The lost man's inability to save himself does not equal the inability to respond to God's gracious, powerful appeal for all the lost to repent and believe. The lost man's inability to attain righteousness by pursuing it through works does not equal the inability to attain righteousness by pursuing it through faith. These are all assumptions that our opponent continue to make. Dr. Zacharides argued that free will cannot be demonstrated, and yet we read dozens of verses in our opener demonstrating choice. They read nothing to demonstrate determinism. As my opponent has rightly argued, there are no passages in all of Scripture that demand determinism. However, there are dozens upon dozens of passages that demand choice. Dr. Zacharides argued that man can thwart God's will on our position. This is a question-begging argument. It presumes it's not God's will for mankind to have libertarian free will. They're just presuming their position and then arguing against us. That's question-begging. He also argues, without me, you can do nothing. Amen. We agree. We agree that we can't choose right from wrong unless God gives us the ability to choose right from wrong. We can't know him unless he reveals himself to us. Who can believe unless they have heard Romans 10, 14? Of course we can't do anything without the grace of God. Uh, it was a straw man, as already pointed out, that we believe that God's grace doesn't come before. Of course God's grace comes before. He sent his son. He sent the gospel. He sent the Holy Spirit. Is that not enough? Is the gospel not sufficient to do what the Bible says it was sent to do? What does the Bible say the gospel was sent to do? These things were written so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. What's the order there? That by believing you may have life in his name. Our opponents get the cart before the horse. They say you have to have life in order to believe. John 20, 31 says you believe so as to have life. Ezekiel 18 says repent so as to live. Get rid of your sin so as to create yourself a new heart. That's the order of scripture again and again and again. He argued that God sent dreams, and he says, I withheld you from sinning. In other words, God stopped him from doing what? From committing adultery. Did God decree for him to want to commit adultery and then stop him from committing adultery, or is God thwarting the free will of that king? Of course, Calvinists talk about sometimes, inconsistently, mind you, about God permitting certain things which, by the way, Calvin calls a vain refuge and childish to say that God permits anything when everything is by his sovereign decree. But yet Calvinists oftentimes use the word permission. That's not their word. That's our word. God is permitting what? What is there to permit if there's not free will? What is there to restrain if there's not free will? The king wanted to commit adultery. The king wanted to do this thing. So what did God restrain? The free will of the king. That's a demonstration of free will, not a, a denouncement of it. God orders them to commit adultery, my opponent says. Not even Calvin, I don't believe, taught that God orders adultery, that God commands sin. I, I, that baffled me, quite honestly. He goes on to argue, as I've already opposed in my opener, that crucifixion that the God's determination of the crucifixion somehow equals determinism of all things. Again, my sting operation of the police officers already demonstrates the fallacy of that argument. A police officer can hide his identity, much like Jesus hid his identity from the Pharisees of the day by speaking to them in parables, lest they see, hear, understand, and repent. He, he hid his identity, much like a police officer would in a sting operation. How, what does he do? He uses their own evil intentions. He doesn't cause their evil intentions. He uses their already evil intentions to bring about a good purpose. So he brings about the selling of drugs. Does that mean the police officer wants the selling of drugs? Of course not. He wants drugs to be to taken off the streets to protect us in the same way in the crucifixion. It's not because God wants people to kill the innocent. It's not because God has decreed for them to have those evil desires. It's because God is using their already evil desires for his good purpose and his plan. He also seems to equate foreknowledge with determinism. But this is a modal fallacy conflating certainty with necessity. Dr. James, uh, uh, excuse me, Dr. William Lane Craig and other well-known philosophers take this on full board and do a great job 
ultimately undermining, you can go to Boethius, uh, the uh, fifth century. Uh, Aquinas argued this, C.S. Lewis argued this, that just because something is foreknown does not necessarily mean it's determined by the one who foreknows. Thank you. I think the fundamental uh, uh, difference in this debate is going to be is that we believe salvation is of the Lord, just the Lord, but their position is there's always a but, but, and that's the thing we're going to flesh out in the Q&A time. So if he says God does not determine, God does not determine, that's something you're going to hear quite often in their arguments. Well, what about Proverbs 16? What about Proverbs 16? What does it say to us? It says that, you know, the lot fell in the lap but it's every decision is from God. What about the decisions of men? What did my brother point out here earlier? He pointed out the topic of, of Abimelech, right? Abraham took his wife and said, this is my sister, and Abimelech tried to take that woman to be with him. And God appeared to him in a dream and says, you're going to die because you're going to take this man's wife in the integrity of my heart. And God says, I know the integrity of your heart, but... It was I who kept you from sinning against me. It was I, he said, that did not let you touch her. What about Genesis uh, 45 and Genesis 50? What was the, the message from Joseph to his brothers? He said, do not be distressed or angry. He says, for, for you sold me here. It was God who brought me here. Again, it was God who brought me here. And again, what happens after their father had died? After their father had died, they were fretful that... He was going to seek reprisal after him, and he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He's saying God doesn't determine the evil, even the evil actions of men. What about, what did I just quote, Genesis 45 and Genesis 50? What about Pharaoh that he mentioned earlier? Doesn't Exodus 4 say that God hardened his heart, that he wouldn't let the people go? Did not God, is not God the one that did it? What about 1 Samuel 16, when God caused an evil spirit to come over Saul? What about 1 Kings uh, 22? In the Holy Scripture, in 1 Kings 22, and it says, God put the lying spirits into the prophets. God put the lying spirits into the mouths of the prophets. God commands even, even, even the uh, winds and the seas. Doesn't Jesus Christ himself? Didn't he rebuke the winds and the sea and said, be, be calm and still? And even, and even the winds and the seas obeyed. What about even a donkey? The donkey looked up to Balaam and says, you know, in uh, Numbers 22, and said, you know, you know, what is it I have done that you have struck me this many times? And are, are you commanded to question God with that? You really need to read Isaiah 29 and Isaiah 45. You know how we made it very clear how, oh, so the, the one who was made, say to the maker, have you made me? Isaiah 45, so, so the one who was uh, the, the clay, say to the one who fashioned it, what have you done? Because that's essentially what they are doing here. The problem is they don't have an understanding of God or even the, the magnitude of sin. The Bible tells us something here in John 1. He came into the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. They were ignorant of God. What about the text also that tells us, it says, a man must be born again. Are you going to give yourself a new heart? In Ezekiel, when it said, I will give them a new heart and a new spirit, are you going to give that to yourself? Or is it a gift of God? What also about John 5.25? The dead is coming, is now here, the, 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 the time is coming, is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall live. Did Christ say in John 6, a man can receive nothing unless he exercises free will or draw himself to me? No, he says, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. It has to be God that draws the individual. But also about John 8:34. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever practices sin is a slave of sin. He is a slave of sin. Ephesians 2 describes to us that we are children of wrath following the course of the world, following the, the, the prince of the power of the air, and we were by nature children of wrath. Does it say because of your free will? No, it doesn't say that. It says, but God who is rich in mercy. 
because His great love that which He loved us. And that is essentially the fundamental difference between our argument tonight and our opponents. We say salvation is of the Lord, period. Period. There's always going to be a but, and when we get to the cross-examination, we'll make that known. Thank you. Ephesians chapter 1, we're told that God is blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. In love, having predestined us, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And again in verse 11, in whom we have been made an inheritance or obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And indeed, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. This is clearly God predestining those that believe. He's predestining those who in themselves are unable to do anything to become the children of God. In this book, in chapter two, it tells us who we are outside of Christ and we're dead in trespasses and sins. It's very clear that we once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Now, I want you to notice throughout these first five verses in Ephesians 2, there's nothing about what man does. Not a thing. In Ephesians 1, 3 through 5, there is nothing that man does. Not a thing. This is the monergistic work of God. God predestines, and this is how he affects his predestination in the life of those who are dead in their sins. So, to say that the Bible doesn't teach predestination is not a question of, well, how many times does he use the, the word? But the whole concept of predestination is found throughout scripture because God determines the end from the beginning, okay? There are other times when these ideas are found in scripture. God predestines according to his grace, his will. He has predestined to receive a people for his son. He has chosen them, and he has marked them out from before the foundation of the world. And when Jesus prayed for those disciples of his, he said, I do not pray for the world. I pray for those that you have given me. To, to say that God's will is for everyone to be saved and then for everyone not to be saved doesn't mean that God's will is faltered is a cop-out. If God wants to save everybody, if that's his will to save everybody, and everybody's not saved in the end because man doesn't accept Christ, then man has thwarted the will of God. No matter how much he claims it's a strong man, it's the inevitable conclusion that God's will has failed. There is a Baptist preacher that has gone on record and has said that hell is the eternal monument of failure of the triune God. I asked my brothers here, not brothers, I, I didn't want to say that, I'm sorry. I, 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 I retract that statement. I asked my opponents here, will they, will they stand up, will they stand up and accept that this is the true inevitability of their position? That hell is the monument to the failure 
of the triune God. Okay, I'm going to move my chair. Okay, we have come to the time tonight for cross-examination, and again, the traditional Baptist will go first, and uh, what I'll do is I'll just set the timer, and my phone will just kind of be here. Okay. And you can just ask him to see that. All right. So, it'll be 10 minutes for each team, and uh, go ahead. Okay, so, and just to understand in my mind uh, where y'all are coming from, because I couldn't quite discern that from your opening statement since it made very little sense. Do you affirm the London Baptist Confession of 1689, or do you um, affirm something beyond that, as in a kind of necessity fatalism um, view of providence? Yeah, I'll say. We affirm the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Uh, London Baptist Confession of Faith as a summarization of faith, an affirmation of worship, a teaching outline, a guard against heresy. Uh, we affirm it also as a means of edification. We're not looking to the London Baptist Confession to be equally authoritative with the Bible, so no. But we do affirm the London Baptist Confession as, a, as merely a means of edification and just so that we have a, a you know, clarity of, of Scripture. So you do believe, or you do affirm um, that... Chapter 9 has a definition of free will. Yes. And you don't believe that that contradicts what you said tonight about Not at all. no such thing exists. Not at all, because it also says in the Westminster Confession, it also says that we have effectual calling. In other words, it's a monergistic calling. It's not merely an individual choosing salvation, but God has to subdue the heart, draw the sinner to himself, and call that sinner. Okay, when, it, when it says God hath endued the will of man with the natural liberty and power of acting upon choice that is neither forced nor by any necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. Do you affirm that statement? We, we affirm the Bible, sir. We don't affirm anything this that is the takes precedent. That you sent me. Look, hey, I, I didn't come here tonight to debate what the confession says. We came to debate what the Bible says. Leave well, the confession the alone and let's get back to the Bible. Well, we're trying to get a clearer understanding of your We do not view. affirm free will, sir. That's it. Well, I understand you, you don't. That. So I'm asking you. You said that the statements made no sense. I'm telling you. Is it clear now? We do not affirm free will. That much I said before I asked the first question. I asked about your view of providence, not free will. It, I asked if you affirm the confession because he said so, and then I asked you what your view of providence, which is not the same thing as free will. So if you could answer the question about we affirm providence. We providence from Scripture. Okay, but we're trying to get a definition of what that is. You still haven't defined what you believe. Yes, I believe is. that Ephesians 1.11 clarifies our position. So you don't believe there is any free will, yet the confession that you say you adopt, it gives a definition, chapter 9, of free will, and it gives... Can you uh, please put the confession away? We're not here to discuss the confession. Okay, then can you give us a definition of providence going? besides a question-begging interpretation of Ephesians 1.11? It's not question-begging. It's the clear statement of Scripture. Sir. We agree with the clear statement of Scripture of Ephesians 1.11. So you agree that God does everything after the counsel of his It way. says that God works all things. It's present tense. God is at work in the present for all things after the counsel of his will. So everything that comes to pass is after the counsel of his will. No, God works with everything that comes to no, pass. No, that's not what it, it says. says. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so what is your view of providence? God ordains the end from the beginning. This is Acts 15. This is Isaiah 46. So there is no free will at all. Under your I've said that already. Please, okay. let's move on. All right, but do you believe there is a free will according to the No, I don't believe in free will. Okay, so you disagree with the confession, your own confession. I believe in the confession, as I said before, a summarization of faith and affirmation of worship. We don't look at but it you equally. With chapter nine. We don't view it as equally authoritative as Scripture. We've already we, said we, we're not traditionalists. You're the traditionalists. We, we understand we don't, we don't that you don't take a, a secondary book, okay? I understand, I understand. Please, there's, let's get back to the Bible. Let's kinds, honor there's different the debate. Kinds of we're trying to we we, we are no free will Calvinists, okay? That's it. 
Right, we're, we're not compatibilists. We haven't argued that position. Right. But the answer, so but the ask the questions that are pertinent. What is the biblical view of free will? Yes, we'll put the confession away then and ask me about the Bible. Which, which, is a, which is a presumption that there is a biblical view of free will. That's the question that we propose. It's frustrating. And there is, there is, within the confession you sent me, we prepared based upon the confession you said you affirmed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you told me the exceptions. But again, the, you did not list this as the, one of the exceptions. See, here's the thing. Uh, we've already made it very clear. The confession is a summarization of our faith. We're not here to defend the confession. This is but not a debate me about. You disagreed with the baptism point. You told me you disagreed, but you didn't tell me. You no, I never said I disagreed with, with the baptism point. Nine. I never said that. So okay. I'm saying the difference between the Westminster Confession and the 69. But again, we're getting off topic. This is a topic about free will. If you guys should ask questions, we're here to debate the Bible. That's what okay. we're trying to explain. M many uh, many yeah. apologists use sure. the theodicy defense of free will. Rabbi Zacharias, William Lane Craig, uh, C.S. Lewis. We don't affirm free classically. will. Classically, I understand. We don't. But what I'm trying to ask is, what is your theodicy? In other words, how do you explain the problem of evil as an apologist whenever you face a, somebody who's objecting We've to... Already, I've already explained that up here when I spoke. I said that God has decreed from in himself, according to the most wise and holy counsel of his will, all things whatsoever comes to pass. So everything's done by sovereign decree to demonstrate his power, even the Holocaust, rape, Everything murder, comes things, to all pass. Things, he decrees it to demonstrate his power. Everything so, comes to pass. So your pass view of providence then, if I, if I understand your selective choosing from the confession, which you just quoted, uh, is that God has decreed, and in that sense, that means that he has meticulously determined all thoughts, words, and deeds, and events that take place in the cosmos that are necessary events. I've already explained the definition. God hath decreed from in himself all things whatsoever that comes to pass. Right, that's a wise. statement. Okay. I'm asking for your explication of the statement. Your, my what kind? My what? You, to explain your view of that statement. My view of that statement is that God decrees everything. Nothing comes to pass that God did not decree. Right. So does that entail that all things that come to pass are necessity, of necessity, they not no, have we're not fatalists. We don't affirm necessity, yeah. okay? We have gone on record to tell you, look, we don't hold to free will. Yeah, we, In we the get, spectrum of ideas, okay? Yeah. In the spectrum of ideas, you start off with Pelagianism, then Semi-Pelagianism, where you guys are, then Semi-Augustinianism, Augustinianism, then Semi-Augustinianism, semi -Augustinianism, then Mol Molinism, and then you have Soft Determinism, okay? Then you have yeah. Determinism, and then you have Fatalism. People like, uh, what's his name, Hume Kang. You know, he's a determinist. These, these are different positions. That's not what we're affirming. We don't affirm that this is the only way things could be because we affirm a personal really, agent behind, but, but behind Dr. the Dr. created order. With respect, it's really hard to know what you affirm because the statement you sent us for preparation was debate. I didn't send you anything, sir. I didn't send you anything. I'm sorry, Sonny, your, your opponent. It's, it's a summarization of faith. It's a summarization of faith. We don't have, I mean, the debate is what we're is here to debate. It's about the Bible. The, the, the debate topic is what is a biblical view of free will? That's yeah, the right. debate topic. What is and a biblical view of free will? No there is no free will. will. There is no free will at no. all. Yeah, no. we're not arguing free will. So, so but you're I saying that. Should be different so why I'm the asking you. Be different. Because we affirm that the biblical view of free will is, is that there is no free will. What is the biblical view of free will, and that presumes there is a biblical view of free will, and you come in here saying you don't believe in a biblical that the Bible teaches free will at all. And no, you it, send it, us, it you teaches send us a statement enslaved. saying you do. I did not. I did not send you anything, you, sir. Your, your group sent us this. Saying I don't know what he said. I, I'm not privy to that. Faith, just no, it's I, no. We're not here to debate. So I mean, our position is that the Bible teaches man's will is enslaved. Okay. Okay. You're not here he's, to debate? He's dead in his trespasses and sins. Did you say you're not here to debate? No, I said we're not here to debate the... the no, that, that's fine. I was just asking for clarity because you gave us a spectrum sure. from... Um, well, it actually goes from hard libertarianism yeah, all the way it, to fatalism. It, whatever, each so, one to his own. But you say you don't like the whole spectrum. No, I said that I'm not a fatalist. I right, am so a hard determinist. You are a hard determinist. Yes. Okay, I'm so a wanna... consistent Calvinist. I affirm what Leighton said about John Calvin. Right. That there is no permission, there is no soft, you know, okay. notion of but you did argue, God is honored but you did argue in, your opener. in everything that comes to pass. He's going to be glorified in everything. But you did argue in your opener that God restrained the king from committing adultery. What is he restraining if not the free will of the king? No, I didn't presuppose that he has free will. I already told you I don't believe. I said that what is he, he, restraining? he restrained it. Now, if what is your view is correct, then why didn't he let what? him do what he wanted to do? So God restrains the sins he never decreed to take place in the first place? 
God restrains his own no, determination. No, 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 you misunderstand the point. Well, you just said that you're a determinist so that God determines everything. So yes. God determined God determines to restrain everything that comes to pass. Someone including from, sins, including the destruction right. of Jericho, including so, when a person falls. Yes, yeah. all of these things. So you believe that God... I believe God determines for Adam to fall. Yes, and you believe that God restrained the sexual intercourse that God never decreed to no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying well, you said he decree. I'm saying that at this point in the narrative, we don't know what God's decree is. You don't know what God's decree is, and I don't know what God's decree is. What, Nobody what knows what God's what, decree what is. Trying to get to is if, if, what I'm saying is, under your let's, view, let's how do you make sense of a passage like this? Let us ask a question, okay? When, when Jonah wanted to flee Nineveh, God in, interrupted, sent a big fish, a storm, to make him change his will. That demonstrates freedom of the will because God is changing his will. His will is to run. God's will is for him to go to Nineveh. So God you're uses, saying that God orders God uses, people's will? Correct. God can, and he does, sometimes convince, persuade through natural means, blinding lights, big but fish, then went to bring. Will. You're arguing for freedom he's, of he's, choosing one way and okay, the other. Well, you're still saying that you have so um, You begin with a definition of free will, so I don't understand the question. Okay, I think our time is up. Okay, I'll go with the first question. Given your view that God doesn't predestinate anyone to hell, how do you account for Judas? How, by view that God doesn't predestinate anyone to hell, how do I account for Judas? Yes. Well, with Judas, it was foretold that Jesus would be betrayed. But again, we don't believe that foreknowledge is causation. Foreknowledge means foreknowledge. And so God foreknew that Judas would betray Jesus and said so centuries prior that Jesus would be betrayed. That we believe that so, God has omniscience and that's, that's a divine attribute of God. Okay, well, you claim that you believe in libertarian free will. I don't believe that you've demonstrated that that philosophical definition is grounded in scripture. It's not there. How does What about your the definition of choice? Okay, I haven't finished my question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, how does your definition of free will line up with passages like Romans 9.16, which says it's not of him that wills, of Ephesians 2, where we're dead in trespasses and sins, in 2 Timothy 2.25 and 26, where it says that people outside of Christ are bound by the devil to do his will. Also, in Ephesians 2.8-9, what we have is God saying that when you believe, it is not of yourselves. So how does free will play into these verses? the exact way that I said in my opening statement. So we affirm that man is dead in sin. We affirm that man is a slave to sin. We also affirm what those metaphors mean. So to say dead in sin, for example, okay, uh, the body without the spirit is dead. Do you agree with that statement in the book of James? That, that is a way that they understood. I agree with every statement in the Bible. Okay, good. So they understood death as a separation of the body from the spirit because life was the breath of life breathed in the dirt, okay? So that sense of separation, the body without the spirit is dead, becomes the basis for the metaphor. Now in the metaphor for dead, the dead metaphor, if you want to call it spiritual death or metaphorical death, that Paul is speaking about is the same as you find in the garden where God said the day you eat this fruit, you will surely die. He lived 930 years later, but he was immediately separated from access, cut off from the tree of life. Okay, you go to Jesus and the prodigal son, he uses dead in the same way. The son was far off and then he had become brought near. He was once dead, but now he is alive. Paul uses it the same way as a metaphor. If you look at Ephesians 2, what does dead mean? Dead means you were dead in your trespasses of sin. You were far off. You were cut off. You were excluded. You were lacked access. What does being made alive? Brought near, reconciled, and so forth. The, the context of the Bible explains its metaphors. You don't have to dump theological freight from outside the Bible to determine what these statements mean in their context. So we understand dead in sin means that you are cut off. So it doesn't follow that when God extends his grace to us, that that means we have no capacity to respond to God's grace. So dead men can do things. Well, in fact, in Ephesians 2, it says the dead do things. The dead walk and the dead live. Where? So, yeah, of course. Where does it say that? The dead rebel. Where, where, where does it say that they walk? 
If you take the metaphor what are you talking to, about? I'm not, I'm not sure if I you take the, let's, uh, if you take It the says metaphor, that they walk after the council of right. the on flesh. Is that doing something or is that not? That's doing something. So that, and that to you is, is, is what? Okay. So I don't think that you've answered the question in terms of the, the, the will, because John 1.13 says we're born not of the will. I agree. Ephesians tells us we're dead. Romans 9 says it is not of the will. Okay, Jesus said you will not come to me in John 5. That means that they don't want to do it, right? They, you will not come to me. John 6 says you cannot come to me. Right. Now show me one verse in scripture, not an imperative, please, but a verse that says you can come to the Son. I have verses all over the place that tell you you cannot, but where do you have one verse that says you can? Don't give me a verse that says you should, because as I said in my opening statement, you Actually, cannot turn an imperative into an indicative. Read Actually, Luther. the scripture says that we, who can come unless they've heard? So we can't come unless revelation comes. So in other words, we have to hear in order to believe. So you're correct in saying no one can come to the Son unless they first hear, and no one can hear unless there's a preacher. So God graciously sends a preacher. God graciously sends Holy Spirit-inspired messengers. God graciously sends the Holy Spirit down like fire to bring conviction to sin. That is sufficient to enable the lost to respond willingly. It's not effectual no, it says, to cause oh, certain people to believe okay. without no, no, a choice. No, it's effectual yeah. because Jesus says he will come and I will raise him on the last day. Okay, okay let me go to the next question. Uh, please explain your exegesis of John 3.16 in regards to the believing ones, or as the KJV puts it, whosoever shall believe it. That all who believe, all the believing ones. Yes. Right. Yeah. What is your exegesis of that? That all those who believe in Jesus will have everlasting life. All those that believe in Jesus. All who, the believing who are they? ones, yes. The believing ones. The, they're the believers. Okay. So I, what, I, if, I, what you're wanting to say is that that, that is a descriptive, not prescriptive statement. No, it's I'm not asking. an invitation, that's for sure. It's not an invitation. What about the... It's a declaration. So, it's not an invitation. But the, but the question well, is, but the, but the just, question is just, yeah, how can a person believe? How does a person believe? Is it something they do of their own, their own self? Or does God have to draw that person to himself? Well, my understanding is, okay, pre-Calvary, the Father is drawing the remnant to the Son. Post-Calvary, Jesus says he will draw all men to himself. The Spirit will come and convict the world of sin. And, uh, but that doesn't answer my question. I didn't ask that question. Yeah, I said, you, asking, how does a person believe? Uh, what I want you to explain today is oh, how can respond, a person believe? Does the, does, does the decision, does that have to be, is it your decision or is it God's? That's the question. Is it your decision or is it God's? Oh, it, to, to believe in the Son. Yes. Okay, well, I understand believing to be kind of more of a, a believing allegiance to the Son. So that is, that is, repentance and faith is something that agents do. It's not something that God does for himself. So I understand that when God gives us his grace, we have to respond in gratitude. That's how the... Okay, but answer the question. So Who causes have, you to believe? Is it you... Is it your belief, or is it God determining you to believe? You're not well, answering the question. there's a chain here where you receive conviction, yes. you receive revelation, and then you either repent and believe or you do not. Okay, but who causes you to do that? Is this something you do, or is it something that God causes God you to do? God enables us to believe, God but we're responsible right. to whether we trust in Him or so not. So is it your... Okay, okay l l let me follow up, because this is not going anywhere. It says in Colossians, uh, in Ephesians, sorry, Ephesians 1.19, okay, that Paul is talking to the believers, and he's explaining to them, how they believe. He's talking about the revelation of the exceeding greatness of God, his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. If we, if we are believers who result of God's work according to the same way he raised Christ, which is the next thing he says, you're saying to me that God's power can be resisted? Well, we don't assume that God is trying to irresistibly save people and failing. So you, like, you, like you, are you not assume. saying that God wants we're to save everyone? That God, no, he's not, well, trying, we're saying not, not irrespective of their choice, no. We believe that God wants to save those who believe. And therefore, you can't impose your view of believe. irresistibility upon us and then okay, say God wait, is wait, failing. Wait, wait. He's, saying that the, he's saying that your question actually presupposes something that right. we reject the premise of the question. You reject the premise of this text. No, we reject the premise of your question. No, the text says we believe according to the power of God. Right. If we, we believe quoted, according you, to the power of God, you quoted what the is text it that and leads? you asked a different question. 
That's what he's, he's responding to. No, I'm, I'm following up from the idea of who causes you to believe. This text says that it's the power of God. If there was no gospel, then no one would believe. Okay, but it says here that God's power causes you to believe. We're, so, we don't deny the, 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 that God enables man to believe. But that's the word, enable. That's not what grant. it says in the text. It doesn't say that he effectually causes it. No, it and says in the text that we believe by, according to the power of God. According to the power of God, which by, he brings revelation. So he brings the light through his Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's not what it's saying. And therefore, well, that's your interpretation. That's why we're having a debate. Because you have an interpretation and we have ours. Our interpretation so is not interpret that the verse? power. We, that, our that interpretation not, is not, not the effectual. power. Are you saying it's not Can effectual? I answer the question? I don't I'd love know. to. You, you, you're reading. I would love to answer the question if you <laughs> okay, pause for a moment. Go ahead. The power of God unto salvation is the gospel according to Romans chapter 1. The gospel is what gives the person the ability to believe. But you are responsible as to whether you trust him or you don't. Otherwise, everyone who goes to hell goes to hell because God rejected them before the foundation of the world. Everyone who is in hell is ultimately in hell because God hated them first under your system. No, and under that's absolutely system alone is not. But that's, that's, a, that's not part of the question. Do you deny that? Yes, I do. I believe that Romans 9 answers that. So those in hell, you believe, aren't there because God ultimately rejected them before the foundation of the world? No, I do. Absolutely. No, he does. Yes. You do believe that? Yes. So where is that taught in the scripture? In Romans 9. Romans 9 teaches that all people who go to hell are determined to go to hell before the foundation of the world. Yes, because of the illustration from Isaac and Jacob. Uh, okay. uh, um, Jacob and Esau, I'm sorry. All right. Oh, okay. Well, it's been a, a feisty evening. I think mm -hmm. we can all agree. <laughs> Uh, Do we do the closing before or after the tweet? My understanding is that the the summary is is now. But you want to do the closing after the Q&A? No, uh, no, it's fine. I just didn't remember. Do we do closing now? I thought we we're doing Q&A now, and then we're doing closing now first. Yeah, yeah. You want to do that? Okay. So we're going to go ahead and move to Q&A then. So. Um, oh, are we going to do the Q&A of the audience and then yeah. closing afterwards? Oh, okay. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, that's. Who knows what might come up in the Q&A? That's true. Yeah, you might want to address it. You might want to address it. Okay, so uh, we set aside 30 minutes tonight for audience Q&A. Uh, in the past, we've had some sometimes grandstanding, uh, if you will. So we've asked people to write questions uh, in. And uh, if I could have one of my volunteers, where'd all my volunteers go? I had four, and they all disappeared. Could some volunteer uh, gather? Thank you. Thank you. These are HBU volunteers. Right. Thank you, HBU volunteers. Hey, there you go. You even get applause. And if you have not, and there's a, there's a question in the back as well. Um, and if you uh, still have a question and we have time, or if you think of another question we have time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do, uh, what I'm going to try to do is the moderators to go back and forth with, uh, with questions for each group. Uh, let's see, so uh, I had you circle who the, who the question was for. Um, more, okay, um, I'm going to tell you now we're not going to, anyway, huh? we're not going to, well, we're not going to get to them all. I'm going to go ahead and say that now. Um, give me just a moment. How long do we have to answer? And then um, two, minutes. two minutes. Two minutes and two minutes. Two minutes and two minutes. That's right. So two minutes each yeah. for each question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's true. This is a really long question. It looks like a good one. Well, I know this person. So I'm going to start the timer at 30 minutes. Um, actually, I'm not going to do that. It's 8.36, so we'll be done with this at 9.06, okay? And I need to set a two-minute timer. Okay, um, so this, this is for you guys, for Sonny and uh, Theodore. If you do not believe in free will, then mankind is not making real choices, free, not determined. If that is the case, then how could you know that determinism is true since you would only have arrived at this position by God's immediate causation and not by an openly investigated choice. 
God doesn't have to make your viewpoint match with truth. He only has to be in control of you. Okay, I'll answer. Okay, the first part of the question, um, you're falsely assuming that we know God's secret counsel. The Bible does not command you to question the secret counsel of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29 actually says, the secret counsel belongs to God, but his revealed will belong to us. We're commanded to work with his revealed will, not his secret counsel. Also, when you say that, you know, God determining man's actions, I mean, you're gonna have to examine the scriptures. You can't cherry pick certain Bible verses that somehow consort with your feelings because your emotions are not the ultimate test of truth. The Bible is the ultimate test of truth. So you're gonna have to go to passages like Lamentations 3, where it says, you know, who has spoken a word and it come to pass unless commanded by God. Now listen to this. It says, it's, it makes it very clear in Lamentations 3, 37 through 39. It says that, uh, has it not spoken from the mouth of the Lord that both good and bad come? Again, that both good and bad come. And what should you complain about? A man for the punishment of his sins. So again, the question here really should be brought back to you is, are you examining all of the scripture or just parts of the Bible that you believe consort with your condition? Read it in all of its totality, and that will be able to answer your question. Okay, that was under two minutes. You have 30 seconds. Do you want to add? <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. Okay, two minutes as well. What I believe the questioner is asking, which he didn't answer, is that if you were determined to believe in determinism, and then likewise, I guess we would be determined not to believe in determinism. Um, how can you be sure that your determinations are actually the truth if God's just simply determining you to believe determinism? Well, he says, let's go to, let's go to the Bible. Okay, well, we all go to the Bible. Um, one of the things that Calvinists uh, seem to have trouble with when it comes to the Bible is context. So we can all bring up Bible verses. And as he's told Dan Barker, we always... You know, people want to bring up Bible verses that comport with their feelings, which is what our uh, opponents have done tonight without actually giving any explanations for them. We did our best to explain any time we read a passage. So I agree with the questioner that if you are determined to believe in determinism, then you can't be sure that you believe in determinism because you came to that conclusion but you are just determined to do it, and so you are just, you cannot rationally affirm it. It's circular. I would, so. also, I would also just add to that, that you cannot also, as a determinist, know for certain that you're saved. Because according to determinism, God could have also determined for you to think you're saved, because obviously even you guys would believe there are false believers, and there are people who think they're really going to heaven who really aren't. Well, why do they think that? Because God determined for them to think that. Therefore, you may be one of those people who end up leaving the faith later in life, and you would never know that because God has determined for you to I think that you're seconds. genuine faith. Okay. Well, Calvin called, called it uh, evanescent grace, so that, that's how, what Calvin's term. Right. Okay, the assumption for your, your challenge there We're giving him is, our last 30 seconds. No, 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 I want get, my 30 seconds. Well, they did, they, seconds. They, if we're going to do that, they didn't take their full two minutes. Oh, they didn't? So you can have 10 seconds. Okay. The assumption is that you know what the end is, what the end is determined. You can't say that what, what God has determined up to this point. You don't know. When God told Abraham to slay his son, are you going to say, well, God determined that he's going to slay his son? No. God determined not to slay his son, but at that moment, he told Abraham to slay him. So you can't assume what the end is in the middle. You've got to know what the end is. If you don't know it, okay. and I don't know okay. it. Okay, time. Okay, a question for Jonathan. Uh, Exodus 7.34. Uh, Exodus 7.34. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Isn't this evil? Uh, the, the issue of Pharaoh came up a number of times. Right. Uh, he made Pharaoh last through plagues, uh, which was punishment for Pharaoh not being able to choose to follow Israelites to leave. How do you reconcile this God-directed action? Well, the great thing about that question is that it, it, it gave my answer. It was punishment and judgment against Pharaoh. Now, you. it was punishment and judgment against Pharaoh that God hardened his heart. Okay? Uh, in fact, in Exodus 4, God said that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Before Pharaoh, and, and I know that many non-Calvinists talk about Pharaoh hardening his heart prior to uh, God hardening his heart, that's true. 
that Pharaoh did harden his heart before God uh, started hardening his heart. It was five times. Uh, but God did say that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart in Exodus 4 prior to that. Now, it's not that God wants to take somebody um, that's either neutral. The, Pharaoh was already a wicked sinner and a slave driver. And so God wanted Pharaoh, he literally raise him up or hold him up or let him stand through that. Now, there's three different words in the Hebrew for hardening in the Old Testament in the Exodus narrative. Uh, it means one means to make obstinate, one means to embolden, or uh, one just simply means to honor. So I don't view um, God hardening Pharaoh's heart any different than how any one of us can harden other people's hearts towards other people. God is a personal God who acts in creation. So hardening Pharaoh's heart is not God playing with a voodoo doll or with an action figure. It's not. God hardening Pharaoh's heart is not Jedi mind tricks, or I have mind control over Deba, okay, for those who've seen the Friday movie. Um, God uses means to harden people's hearts in the same way that I could harden uh, Layton's heart if I just decided to punch him in the face. That's one way to harden his heart. I could also strengthen or embolden in, uh, Pharaoh's heart. Okay, two minutes. Response to the same question. Well, I don't think that they uh, can evade the obvious implication of the question, which is that obviously God, God, he said, hardened Pharaoh's heart. And this is the argument that Paul makes in Romans 9. And he said that he would do this and he would raise him up so that he would reveal his power. And this is all part of the history and, you know, the, the evidence for God being the cause of people's salvation. Um, so this is just a mere illustration of the way God operates. So to say that he's already hardened his heart or this is judgment for something that Pharaoh already is. And I like the fact that he says that people are not neutral. I thought that given libertarian free will, everybody has the same opportunity. That's in fact what he seems to be saying in his book about the opportunity to be saved. Everybody has the same opportunity to be saved. Well, what about Pharaoh? How's Pharaoh going to be saved? He doesn't have the opportunity because God hardened his heart. You have more time? Okay, I'm done. Okay. A uh, question for Sonny and Theodore. Um, I think this was a, I think a lot of people found this part of the debate interesting. Um, do you believe, Theodore mentioned specifically, that only Calvinists can be Christians. He was unwilling to refer to his opponents as brothers. No, it's just that I'm not omniscient. I, I don't know. I mean, given, you know, if we sat down like we did earlier, you know, I was cordial, I greet them, but I don't know if they're truly born again. And based on the evidence of their position, I have, I have my own personal reasons to suspect maybe they are not. So I can't, you know, I don't know. I don't believe they understand the grace of God. I'll just, I'll add one thing in here too. Um, the topic of this debate is about free will. It's not about their salvation. The questions that we're supposed to be asking this topic is about free will, not about whether or not we believe someone here to be truly born again or not. Again, that's what the purpose of this debate is about. I just want to remind us all about that. Okay, do you want to? No, I, li I like Theodore's answer because it's honest and it's consistent. It's consistent with a video that I saw of Sonny. Sonny also said that he does not call people he has never met or does not know um, brothers, because he was asked outside some protester, I don't remember what he was protesting, filmed it, thought he was being a big shot. And, and, and Sonny says the same thing, I don't know you, you are not, I, I can't call you my brother. Um, so, that's, that's fine. I, I, I'm not upset by it, I don't know if Layton's upset by it or not, I'm, that's fine. Well, He's not what, a judge of my I, think, I think what the problem would be is knowing that our sociological differences would somehow preclude somebody not being a brother based upon our differences of, of sociology. Um, that would be a problem for me. Um, but also, what also seems to be consistent about your view, and I do appreciate that you are consistent when it comes to this, and that consistency is that if God determined me to be a non-Calvinist, a traditionalist, then it only makes sense that God favors you 
because he determined you to believe the Bible rightly, and somehow he determined me to believe the Bible wrongly, so he loves you more than he loves me, and so it would be more consistent for you to say all non-Calvinists are actually not Christian. That's a more consistent view on your, your no, portion. Again, he, otherwise, he favors right, some sorry. elite <laughs> Christians who are raised up at a higher level given a certain amount of knowledge that, that aren't granted to all the masses of other Arminians and non-Calvinists out there. Take, I've, take I've 30 already, I've already said that you can't make those kinds of statements about what God has decreed. You can't say that God has decreed you to be uh, a non-Calvinist. Because you don't know. Up to, up to this point, yes. That's, well, that's my point. You don't Lewis, know what the end is. C.S. Lewis died as a Calvinist. So you can say he was decreed not to ever be a Calvinist. So do you think he was an unbeliever? No, I don't, I'm not getting into who C.S. Lewis is or what he did. I'm asking you, how can you make those claims if you don't know what the end is? Right, but God doesn't saying, say anywhere in, in the, the Bible. You cannot applies. make. The no, the argument doesn't. I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that God okay. ordained you to be. See, it, it, okay, okay. Um, I, you did write your names on the cards, and uh, I did ask for them, and I haven't said them. So I think I just won't say them for the rest of the cards, too. Um, but thank you all for your questions. A uh, question for Leighton and Jonathan. Um, if God does not bring evil... Who does? Did God not create the heavens and the earth? Um, free will. That's how the theodicy, the theodicy of free will, that God created mankind with the ability to make free choices. And therefore, as I read in my opening statement, that the evil desires of man are not from God. That's what the Bible says. The evil desires of man are not from God. That's St. John, okay? If determinism is true, the evil desires are also from God. So what we say is that the defense of free will is a defense of divine holiness. What we're arguing is that the reason evil exists is because God has created mankind with the ability to make free choices because that is what is required for real relationship and love worth having, as C.S. Lewis rightly argues. Otherwise, we have a world of automatons, of puppets. God pulls the strings. You do what he's determined for you to do, and that's not a real world. Well, well I would just say this is one of the areas that I, I would personally agree that Augustine probably got it right, um, one of the few. But Augustine says that evil is not a thing. So when the Bible talks about God creating evil, what He's not talking about moral wickedness. It's talking about calamity. It's usually contrasted with peace or shalom. Uh, so it's not moral wickedness. See, there is no darkness in God at all. But according to the Westminster Confession of Faith and the London Baptist Confession, it says that God doesn't bring, even though God could and uh, bring things up, uh, to pass upon any and all supposed conditions, uh, it actually dots the hat to Molinism. It takes away any defense to... Um, the statement in the first thing where it says God is not the author of evil by saying God doesn't decree anything based on any of those supposed conditions. God decrees things based on his good pleasure. So it turns out that all the evil and darkness that we have in the cosmos was in God after all is the conclusion of their confession. But James says no. Okay, two minutes. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's funny that you, you bring that up about theodicy because free will doesn't work, and determinants out there of all stripes, Christian and non, have shown that that's a fallacy. Now, from our perspective, God does ordain everything. On your view, given free will, God kind of took a risk, didn't he? Look how many people are going to hell, and he doesn't want them to, and yet he decided to create us all, to give us free will, and they're all going to hell, and God can't do anything about it. That's your view. Will you own it? Will you own it that God was really unwise in making this world the way he did? God wants a free world with free moral creatures. That's what we believe. And therefore, God's not failing by allowing for free choice any more so than you as a parent. If you allow your child... Did God know that people would, would reject him? Well, I'm not going to make them jump into the modal fallacy of, of conflating necessity with, um, with um, uh, that which is known. In other words, that which is known can be certainly known, but not necessary. I'm not saying it's necessary. I'm saying certain. Well, so it was certain. Again, we, we Did God know that. We, we, yes. are, we are not denying yes. that God certainly knows. Okay. We are denying that certain knowledge equals determinism. I'm not saying it equals determinism. What I'm saying is that it's given your free will, uh, how can you know? Questions. Let's be how, how does your view allow God to know? Questions. The audience is asking questions now. So let's be respectful of that. 
Okay. Well, we have two minutes to, to answer, so. Um, okay. You still have 30 seconds. Okay. Well, I, 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 again, I, I believe that the, yeah, I believe that the, the view, or the question is, what, what, what is the question? I got lost in it. The, read the question again, well, please. Well, I'd have to find it. Uh, uh, yeah. I think it was about if God doesn't bring evil, who does? Okay. So well, my point is, yeah, I, I believe God ordains everything. So it's not sin for God to ordain sin. That's it. If you think that God did not ordain sin, then whence cometh sin? Do you not understand that if God does not ordain it and it happens, it means that God is powerless to prevent it? All right, time. time. Okay, uh, question for Sonny and Theodore. If free will of man thwarts God's will and man's choice of salvation would override God's will, then can you define what... God's will is. Could free will of man be given to man as part of God's will? Can you get, answer the first, first part? First part again is, uh, let me stop the clock here. Can I look at the question? And yeah. If free will of man thwarts God's will, first of all, free, free will does not thwart God's will because it is a belief that is based upon superstition and not scripture. The second part is says, and man's choice of salvation would override God's will, then can God define what God's will is? Yes, God can define what God's will is, and I'll explain it to you. There's over 774,000 words, 31,000 verses, over 1,189 chapters of the Bible, and over 2,000 times God declares his word to be true. It's called the Holy Bible. This right here is God's will, his revealed will. That is what we are commanded to obey. That is what we are commanded to believe. Um, also, do I just have time? Yeah. Also, the, the, the distinction between what God commands is often called God's will, but usually when we're talking about God's will, we really mean what he has decreed, okay? The counsel of the Lord is forever settled in heaven, okay? He does everything after the counsel or according to the counsel of his will. That means his will of decree. Now, when God commands us to do something, that's an obligation we have. So there is a distinction between what has often been called the prescriptive will and God's decretive will. All right. Now, I think the question, in, our, in my opening statement, I said that free will is not a superpower. Now, only our Calvinist opponents treat free will as a superpower. We, we don't think it's a superpower because it's something God has given everybody. Okay, it's not, a, it's not something that can thwart God's will, which is exactly what I said in my opening statement. But the question tonight is what is God's will? And we believe that God's will is to save believers and to damn non-believers. Our opponent also just said a little earlier that God can't do anything about it. He did something about it. He sent Jesus. To say he can't do anything about it oh, totally undermines the gospel that God has sent Christ for us to be able to believe and he makes a way of salvation. He makes an appeal for all men to be reconciled through faith in him. I wanna read this. Man in his state of innocency had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet was unstable so that he might fall from it. That's the London Baptist Confession of Faith which Sonny said to me saying he affirmed this. And yet here in the debate, they have disaffirmed that God gave freedom to the first man and the first woman. Was God sovereign over Adam and Eve? Was he? Was he sovereign over Adam and Eve? Because he had freedom. Even the London Baptist Confession of Faith said that he could have sinned or not sinned. That he had freedom. Did God lose his sovereignty back then? What about us today? Do I have the freedom to become a Calvinist today? Do you have a freedom to become a Calvinist today? If you have such freedom, has God's sovereignty failed? Has, has God just not sovereign anymore? Of course God's sovereign because sovereign means God's ability to rule and do whatever he pleases. We just don't assume that God is pleased to meticulously determine the world like robots. Okay, do you believe that it's God's will to save everyone? We're, 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 yeah, we're out of time on that question. Um, I, 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 I believe this is a question for, for you, although, 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 it wasn't, uh, although it wasn't said. 
Uh, when you say Adam used his free will, that must be you guys. Uh, when you say Adam used his free will in the fall, do you presuppose God in his omniscience did not know Adam would fall? No, we don't presuppose that. We presuppose that God actually foreknows everything. In fact, on our view, check this out. On their view, they believe that God decrees all things whatsoever comes to pass. And on the basis of decreeing all things whatsoever come to pass, God foreknows future contingencies. Okay, I, well, That's the Calvinist view. I don't know what their view is. It was not ever made clear, except that they don't believe in free will. Now, the problem with this view that God, is that God's omniscience is therefore logically codependent upon God doing something, meaning God decrees. So when God has formulated the decree in eternity past, his knowledge becomes logically increased. So he said we should become open theists. Actually, they are a form of open theism because they have God's immutable attribute of omniscience logically dependent upon God performing an action to decree is to do to be omniscient is a part of God's immutable unchanging nature so they actually have a problem if they don't believe that God's attribute is prior to his decree so we believe that God foreknew that Adam would fall but yet he created anyway because God has purposes in creation to bring glory to himself plus I think their view undermines what foreknowledge really is which would be more impressive if I could foreknow what number you're thinking of between one and a million right now? If I could foreknow, if I could, if I could predict what that is, or if I determined what you were going to say and then made you say it, and then I could predict what you said based upon the fact that I determined for you to say it. It's much more impressive for God to know a free choice of Adam, the free choice of you, the free choice of you. That's true divine foreknowledge. That's power. It's not powerful to foreknow your own determinations. I knew I was going to kick the table just now. And I foreknow that I was going to kick the table today, and I just didn't kick the table. There's nothing impressive about foreknowing your own determinations. Except that God tells us that he has done that. Where in Isaiah 46, he tells us that he has determined the end from the beginning. So he is affirming that. He is saying what you just denied. It's also reiterated in Acts chapter 15. That's exactly why your view doesn't hold water because God determines what will come to pass. What your view needs is for it maybe yes, maybe no because of free will. But then you equivocate on free will because you say that, well, it doesn't really matter because God is sovereign, he knows anyway. But what is it that God knows? Does God know A or B in relation to me eating an apple tomorrow at 12 o'clock? Does he know that I'm a fluid? If he does, yeah, it's okay, I'm talking to you. I'm answering your question. They can hear me. If he does, am I free to not choose that apple tomorrow? Okay. For Sonny and Theodore, uh, in quoting Ephesians 1, 3 to 11, and 2, 1 to 5, why did you skip over 1, 13 to 14, which clearly affirms a response to the gospel is necessary. Well, I mean, we have to be selective, so that was me that cited those passages. We can't read the entire Bible, because I could just throw the Bible at you, right? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. If I, if I say anything tonight, it's this. Go home and read scripture. Read through Isaiah. Read through the entire book. Read through the entire book of Genesis. Come away with free will after you read the entire book of Genesis. Read the entire book of Jeremiah and come away where it tells us, can the leper change his spots? When God says that the heart is deceitful, who can know it? They have know it. have free will. If, I, if you say you know you have free will, let me show you that that's an impossibility. Number one, to equate knowledge with free will is the same thing as saying that you know that there is no determinative influence on you to determinately make you choose one thing over another. You're saying that you are free from all those possible causes, whether it's your upbringing, your genes, whether it's the environment you live in, whether it's God himself acting on you. You are saying by, by affirming free will that you know that nothing determines your actions. The only way you can know that is if you had omniscience. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you are the Lord God Almighty. You cannot know all things, therefore you cannot know that you have free will. And I'll turn it right back around too as well. Even for those of you that said, what about 13 and 14? Well, what caused 13 and 14? Let me explain it to you. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, right? And why does he do it? It tells us in the text. For the purpose of his will and the praise of his glorious grace. And the question you have to ask yourself, is that not good enough for you? Or do you have to attribute that to yourself, to your free will? So ultimately, that's the question and that's the underlying malady that is going to be found in your life with that text. Because it doesn't just say it there, it also says it in Ephesians 1.11. In him we have obtained an apparent an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose of his will and the praise of his glorious grace. Just to correct Dr. Zacharides, it doesn't say that God determined the end from the beginning. It says God declares the end from the beginning just to make sure people know what the scripture actually says. Also, I also want to point out that in Ephesians chapter uh, 1, it says that he chose us in him. That is a preposition of place. Chose us in him. The question is, how do you get in him? How do we become in him? How do we get in Christ? Verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So when were you marked in him with the promised Holy Spirit? When you believed, after the gospel came. That's when you're in him. If you look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter, uh, of chapter 1 of Ephesians, it says the faithful in Christ. That's the audience. He's talking about those who are faithful in Christ. The term in Christ is used almost a dozen times in this first chapter. That is the theme of Paul because he's talking to and about those who have faith in him. It is your responsibility to put your trust in Christ. It's not God's responsibility to make you believe in him. That's your responsibility. Oh, you know. Okay, we only have about three minutes or so from where I don't think we can take more questions, unfortunately. We're just about out of time. Um, in fact, I was going to ask if we could do some shorter questions with, with 30 seconds each. Would y'all be open to trying? Would y'all be open to trying some short questions, 30 seconds each? Okay. 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 Um, can, I, can, I just, can I just say this? Uh, after... <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> After, the, after this, after it's finished, it, you know, if you want to come by, I'm, I'm, I'm open to any questions that you have. So if you want to come, um, you know, if we don't get time, I'd love to honor you know, your questions. So be free to come in. And you know, is for not? Not, not antagonistic. Doesn't no. matter. Notice you said be free to come? Okay. Just notice that. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this question, but I'm going to give you all the freedom not to answer it because it is technically freedom not to related to the, to the topic tonight. But I do think it's a question that people often ask, so you're free to answer it and same, you know, same for you guys. So the question is for you guys. We're trying to do it in 30 seconds each now to get through a few less questions. How does your view of sovereignty differ from that of Islam? Like I said, you're free to answer or not. Islam. Islam has a doctrine that is fatalism. And the way that, that Islam presents the reality is that God couldn't do it any other way. This is the only way he could do it. Obviously, as Christians, we're theists. We believe that God is triune. We believe that he has uh, counsel, will. And the way he has determined things are not necessarily the way that they must be. So our view is a view that God has determined the way things are but not that God was forced to, to make it the way things are. So there's a difference between fatalism, which is what Islam advocates, and uh, Christianity, which advocates that. Okay, 30 seconds. Is this a question about necessary. their view to them, or just any view? In well, view? I thought it was about it, our view. It was, our yeah, view it was directed to Right, them. my response Maybe. to that is, um, first, we start with understanding what the word means. Uh, sovereignty just means God's status. Sovereignty as a word means that God is absolute ruler. There's nothing above God. Um, how it differs from Islam and fatalism, we have not heard an answer tonight. All that we have heard is assertions after assertions, and we're heretics and semi-Pelagian, blah, blah, blah. But what we have not heard is 
how it's different from Islam, and I would say if it looks like a duck. Whack. Well, on that note, um, why don't we, 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 we've reached our 30 minutes for questions, um, so I think we're gonna, we're gonna call the time on the q and I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. Thank you for your good questions. I tried to get to as many as I, I could as quickly as I can, and like they said, they'll be at the reception afterwards uh, for your edification. We have final statements of five minutes each. Uh, as always, the traditional Baptist will go first, Form Baptist will go second, and uh, I'll start whenever you start speaking. You got this. God has created us in his image. We are in the Imago Dei. That is unique to humans, by the way. This is what separates us from the animals. We are rational beings. We have the ability to reason, to deliberate. We have the ability to make choices, moral choices. Animals, however, they're instinctive. They're reflexive. They act according to their quote unquote greatest preset desire. Sound familiar? It's exactly what the Calvinist Sproul and others argue, that we always act in accordance with our preset greatest desire, the greatest inclination. That's merely animal instinct. A carnivorous lion eats meat, not grass, but is that a moral choice? No, it's an instinctive reflex based upon the nature that he was created with by his creator. We are different than animals because men and women make choices to act based upon one of our many, many competing desires and inclinations. So somebody may be inclined to same-sex attraction in the homosexual world, for example. Does that mean they are determined to be homosexual? Or do we believe as Christians that a person has the ability to choose whether to act upon their inclinations? I know my opponents have spoke about homosexuality, but if their view is true, God has determined the homosexual to be homosexual. And they have no real freedom in the matter as to whether they act upon that greatest preset desire of same-sex attraction. This is not a tenable way of Christianity. It's not a workable way to understand human responsibility. The ability of humans to respond. We're able to respond. That's why we're responsible. Calvinism says men choose according to their greatest desire. The desire, in other words, makes the determination on Calvinism. We simply disagree. We say people make determinations. In the same mysterious way God chose to create ex nihilo, he created something from nothing. We can't explain exactly how he does that. Nobody can explain how God creates something from nothing. But so too, we are given by God the ability to create our own choices. God is creative and we are made in his image as creative beings. And therefore, we're given a level of creative ability, the ability to make choices. So the mystery of libertarian freedom is similar to the mystery of creation itself. God created something from nothing. In a similar way, he has given us the ability to create something from nothing, namely our desires and our choices. As 1 John 2, 6 has already said, the desires of the flesh are not of the Father but of the world. According to our opponents, the desires of the flesh are determined by the Father. And yet the Bible says they are not of the Father. The cause of a choice is the chooser. The cause of an action is the actor. The cause of a determination is the determiner. And if God is the only determiner in existence, then what is your theodicy? You've ultimately got God determining the rape and murder and holocaust and all the horrible evil atrocities of this world. Why? So as to demonstrate his power? So as to demonstrate his glory? What about demonstrating his love? Listen, I believe God's glory is important. I believe that we should absolutely glorify God in everything that we do. But our opponents want to glorify God by extolling his power over his enemies where we want to extol the glory of God for his love of enemies, every single one of them, that he doesn't sacrifice most of creation for the sake of his own power and glorification, but instead that he sacrifices himself for the sake of undeserving creation. 
that he lays down his life for all of his enemies. He's like the good Samaritan that stops and helps his enemies. He's not like the Levite that passes by on the other side, but that's exactly what Calvinism ultimately has God doing with most of his enemies. Passing by, letting them go their own way, choosing to sin. Listen, when we read through the scriptures and we understand that God has a plan in redemption, that when Jesus came, he did not reveal his messianess to everyone. He selected some to reveal the truth to, and he hid the rest in parables. He spoke to them in parables, lest they see, hear, and understand. What would be the purpose in speaking in parables under the Calvinistic system? There is no purpose in it because everyone's born, quote unquote, dead like a corpse and couldn't respond otherwise. The fact that God hid his identity from certain people so as to bring about the crucifixion proves, in fact, that mankind does have the freedom to respond when they clearly see and hear the truth of God's revelation. Again and again, we see throughout Scripture, has been demonstrated here tonight, that God is a God of choice, that he has allowed for choice from the very beginning to the very end of Scripture, where he calls all to come who are weak and heavy laden, and he will give them rest. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for listening. Again, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Let me just explain again one of the reasons why I'm glad I hold to what's called Dortian Calvinism. It's a little bit different from more of the moderate, but here's one of the reasons why, because again, when we examine the Bible in light with some of the arguments that we're seeing today, I truly believe that this argument of free will, it distorts the doctrine of election and it breaks up that golden chain of redemption that we see in the Bible. God foreknows, God predestines, God calls, God justifies, God glorifies. And I really believe it does it. Here's why. Because it takes the, the, the majesty of God and the merits of Christ. And here's what it does. It, it robs them of their effectiveness. You know what else it does? It makes God changeable. Because if God has a decree, but it has to, you know, it's only possible if you decide to accept it. Here's what else it does is it elevates the power of the will and it also distorts the comfort of election for those that are in Christ, truly in Christ. That's what the canons of Dort teach. Now, this notion of free will, again, it's not based on scripture, it's based on superstition. And it's certainly not your faith, it's fiction. Okay, let me explain to you why in John 1. Many of you know the passage. Well, you have to believe to those who believed him, to those who received him, they gave him the right to call the children of God. But it also tells us they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Nor of blood, it means it doesn't matter where you were born or who your family is. And also says, nor the will of the flesh. No matter how hard you try to keep the law, whether you do what Pelagius did and just put a high price on God's grace, or you make God's grace cheap by coming in to buy some feeble effort, nor of the will of man. Let me explain to you why the will of man can never be attributed in your salvation because no merit on the part of man or any works performed by us could ever add to his completed or saving work. It is all by Jesus Christ. Now let me explain to you why. In Ephesians 1, remember what it tells us in, in Ephesians 1 and also Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and let me explain to you this, and not of yourselves. It's not of yourself. How could they ever preach that sermon? And not of yourself, but you have free choice, right? God is the sovereign Lord, but he gives you the decision to choose. Not of yourself is exactly what the text says. What about John 3, 27? Every gift comes from God. No one can receive anything unless it be given to him from up above. Please explain to me if you think your choice, if your freedom to choose salvation comes from up above. What about John 6? No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It has to be a work of God. What does Christ call himself in the Bible? He says, I am the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the light of the world, the bread of life, the true vine, the resurrection and the life and the way, the truth and the life. 
So if he's the way, the truth, and the life, guess what we are? Lost, false, and dead. That's the exact opposite. It has to be a work of Christ, only the work of Christ, because as the scripture says, the power of God is in the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. Therefore, the power to save is not in your will. The power to save is in God, in the gospel. That's what the scripture tells us. What about Romans 3? Romans 3 tells us, for in it the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. This right here is a divine work, not your depraved will. Because the Bible doesn't say for in it the righteousness of God through our free will. It doesn't say that. Because free will has never saved anybody. Free will cannot save you. But it says in there, all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely. You know what that word means, freely? It means it cannot be earned or deserved. You don't deserve salvation. You can't say, well, it's not fair. The Calvinist says this. We say this. Do you want fair? If God holds you over the pits of hell like an insect and he propels you into hell, that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is fair. What about Romans 5? Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin. Therefore, death comes upon all because all have sinned. Please explain to me. Left to yourself, apart from God, you are going to do nothing but sin and have death. How can, please explain to me right now, how can a bad tree bear good fruit? Didn't Christ himself say that? A bad tree bears bad fruit and a good tree bears good fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. What about going on further? Look into Romans 8, Romans 9. I mean, these texts are replete with Bible verses that explain to us, not of him who wills, but of God. How many more verses do you, do you possibly need by just simple, a simple running commentary of the Bible that explains to us that it is not of the will, but of God? Get used to that. But God, but God. As Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, thank God for the buts. Thank you very much. Thank you.